Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. A dazzling white hospital room. A narrow, high bed. There is a young boy lying on that bed. He has an oxygen mask on his face. Different wires wrapped around his body. Thin wires are connected to the machines that support life in this recently strong and healthy body. The guy's eyes are tightly closed and his chest is slowly going up and down. A sophisticated device is helping him to breathe. The patient's heartbeat is steady, as indicated by a nice symmetrical line on the monitor. Strange, he looks like he's just sleeping, a woman sitting next to the patient's bed whispers. This is probably the thousandth time she has said this phrase in the past week, the worst week of her life. The young man who is lying on the bed with an oxygen mask on his face is her son, 20-year-old Alejandro. He has always been cheerful, kind, and smiling. Since he was a child, he had been surrounded by a crowd of friends. His friends are also in shock now. They still can't recover from what happened, and they want to come here, to the intensive care unit. But, of course, they are not allowed in. The chief doctor only allowed his close relatives to visit him. Laura was a young woman who had just turned 40. She gave birth to Alejandro when she was the same age as he is now. She was in her third year of university. Her husband, Alejandro's father, was only a year older. Young, inexperienced, but in love and full of hope for a happy family life. Isaac is here too. Unlike his wife, he is mostly silent. His eyes. There's so much longing, pain, and despair in his eyes. During these days, Isaac had become drained, pale, skinny. Laura thought she looked no better than him. But who cares? Does it matter now? Alejandro was a gift. That's what her mother-in-law, Isaac's mother, and Alejandro's happy grandmother had immediately declared. She was the one who had first calmed the young couple down when they turned to her for advice, shocked by the news of Laura's pregnancy. Yes, it was Isaac's mother. Laura was afraid to tell her parents about it. They were still young and quite strict at the time. In addition to Laura, the family also had Rodrigo and Eva, twins, and their parents had a lot to worry about. Of course, they would not have been happy to hear about the sudden and very untimely pregnancy of their eldest daughter. But Veronica was not so young. She gave birth to Isaac when she wasn't young, and he was her only child. Veronica's husband died long ago when her son turned 10, so Veronica and Isaac lived together in a spacious two-bedroom apartment. Isaac introduced his beloved girlfriend to his mother almost immediately. Laura was embarrassed at first, but Veronica managed to relieve the awkwardness and tenseness of the first meeting in some incredible way, making kind jokes and telling some funny stories from Isaac's childhood. She turned out to be a wonderful, intelligent, and very nice person. Laura loved to visit Isaac's home. His mother always greeted her with an affectionate smile and was very kind to her, but never asked any unnecessary questions, managing to keep that fine line between intrusiveness and indifference. Wise, caring, and kind Veronica had worked at the factory as an engineer her whole life, so she was also a very intelligent woman. It was no wonder that when the young people found out about the pregnancy, they went to her first. I think it's... It's a great joy. Veronica's face brightened with a sincere smile. Laura was so grateful to her for this. Isaac's mother took the news not as a problem to be solved, but as something bright and joyful. Laura felt exactly the same way. It was as if her whole body was warm and she felt as if she got wings. But the happiness wasn't unclouded. They were frightened by the uncertainty. She and Isaac were still students, and they had no financial independence. Where would they live? Where are they going to get the money? How would they raise the baby? Would they both have to drop out of university and be left without a degree? Veronica eliminated all the couple's doubts one by one. Where would they live? Of course, in Veronica's apartment. There are three spacious rooms, enough space for everyone, no need to pay rent, and the helping hands of the grandmother are always nearby, which will help a lot the two students. Students? Laura was surprised. But how are we going to be able to study now? 
Like everyone else, you are not the first student with a baby, and you are not the last, Veronica smiled. I'll transfer to a correspondence department, Isaac suddenly said, and then I'll find a job. Good idea, Veronica said, a diploma in the correspondence department is the same. Laura breathed a sigh of relief. She already loved this baby, who had decided to come into the world at such an unfortunate time, and she was afraid that she would have to terminate her pregnancy. If Veronica had not supported them, she would probably have had to do that, because she and Isaac were still too young, too vulnerable, too silly. When Laura decided to talk to her parents, she felt confident, and so did Isaac, because they had a clear plan, they figured everything out. Of course, Laura's mother and father were not happy. The girl had to listen to a lot of reproaches for irresponsibility and carelessness, but in the end, they accepted their daughter's choice and, like Veronica, even rejoiced and felt proud that they would soon become grandparents, while still young and beautiful. Laura then looked at her younger brother and sister and could not hold back a smile. Rodrigo and Eva were only eight years old, but they were about to have a nephew. It was funny. And then Alejandro was born, a healthy, robust baby, tinkling, with adorable dimples on his cheeks. Oh, what a beauty! The midwife smiled, putting the baby on the chest of the excited young mother. He's got dimples on his cheeks and bright, wide eyebrows, he will definitely be happy. Laura looked in amazement at the red face of the baby and could not understand how the nurse had noticed it all of the eyebrows, the dimples. And then the newborn opened his eyes and looked at his mother intently and seriously, staring at her face as if he were getting to know her. That was the moment when Laura felt like a real mother for the first time and loved Alejandro with all her heart. She and Isaac had chosen the name long before their son was born, as soon as they knew the sex on the ultrasound, and they both loved it. The discharge from the hospital was noisy, fun, and heartwarming. Flowers, balloons, happy relatives. Laura stood next to Isaac, who was gently holding a tiny bundle tied with a wide blue ribbon and felt like she was the happiest, the strongest person on earth. Now Laura had a son. A son, her continuation, her joy, her hope. So many good things awaited this boy's love from family members and friends, education, traveling. Of course, he will grow up to be smart, strong, kind, and wonderful. His parents will do everything possible to make sure he gets the best in life. Living with Veronica was pleasant and comfortable. She was wise and tactful. The woman always knew when her help was needed, and when it was better to stay away, she felt it with some inner instinct. She also knew how to find the right words. When Laura was tired or felt that she could not cope, Veronica only had to say one or two phrases, and everything immediately got better. She could become a brilliant psychologist, but the woman loved her job. Even when she had to take a well-deserved vacation, she continued to work part-time at her factory. The management needed her experience and knowledge, and Veronica herself needed the activity and the team, of course. Like her son, she was very outgoing and friendly. Everyone loved little Alejandro. But Veronica? It seems that he became the closest and most dear person to Veronica, literally from the first days. When she cradled the baby in her arms or sang songs to him, she looked so happy, so peaceful, that Laura couldn't hold back a smile. The young mother was glad they loved her son so much, welcomed him so well. She felt that her baby needed it, needed it vitally. Laura and Isaac continued to study. The young husband and father also worked at the same factory where his mother worked. Veronica helped him to get a job there. She asked her boss to hire him. But Isaac worked hard and showed his best side. The young man quickly got a promotion thanks to his responsibility, purposefulness, and intelligence. The student's family started to earn money, not too much, but it was their own money. Laura and Isaac felt financial independence and were proud of themselves. And that was important. Veronica kept saying that Laura and Isaac were doing a great job. It was empowering and encouraging. Alejandro was a funny and intelligent boy. Now Laura regretted that she had had too little time to enjoy his childhood years. She never had a maternity leave. 
When Laura gave birth to Alejandro, she had been a student and devoted a lot of time to her studies. She didn't have the opportunity to spend all her time with her baby like many other moms do on maternity leave. When Laura finally got a degree, Alejandro had just turned three, it was time for kindergarten. Laura had to find a job. But Veronica suggested to wait. You need to spend more time with your son, why are you in a hurry? She said, you'll have a lifetime to work. He's three, it's time for kindergarten, Laura sighed. She really wanted to do what her mother-in-law said, but what would others say? If she decides not to work, then why did she study? He's still a baby. Children take a long time to get used to kindergarten and often get sick. It is very stressful for them. It's better for the mother to stay at home with him for a while. Laura perfectly understood that Veronica saw her daughter-in-law's true feelings and understood her wishes. That's why she offered all these arguments. All Laura had to do was accept the arguments and that would bring happiness. But no. She and Isaac decided that they urgently needed their own separate apartment, like everyone else, and for this, it was necessary to work very hard. Both of them were quite comfortable living with Veronica, but they wanted more. Laura found a job. Alejandro went to the kindergarten. The boy liked it there, he was always sociable and cheerful, and there were friends, classes, various events, games, everything that attracted Alejandro so much. Veronica was right about the frequent sick days. Alejandro, who had never been sick before, now had a cough or fever every month. Needless to say, Laura's employer was not happy about the young employee's endless sick days. His displeasure manifested itself in grumbling and even deprivation of bonuses. Every time her son was sick, Laura dialed her boss's number with shaking hands and listened to his angry tirades. Isaac? He couldn't take a sick day. He had too serious position and too good salary. If he lost it all, their family could forget about their own apartment. So only Laura could take sick days. It was hard, very hard for her to tell the boss about it. Looking at all of this, Veronica made a serious decision. I'm going to retire, she announced over dinner. I've worked enough, it's time to get some rest. Is this because of us? Laura looked at her mother-in-law. It was a wonderful way out, a lifesaver, but Veronica loved her job so much and would probably leave it just for the sake of her grandson, for the sake of them all. No, I'm tired, and I can't keep up with the young professionals. And, to be honest, I'd really like to spend more time with Alejandro. He's growing up, he can attend sports school and various educational clubs. I've dreamed of spending more time with my grandson for a long time. Laura almost cried with gratitude to Veronica. She knew how much her mother-in-law loved her job, but she loved Alejandro even more. From then on, a quiet and balanced life began. Laura and Isaac worked hard and earned money for a new apartment, and Veronica took care of the home and Alejandro. Grandson and grandmother seemed to be on the same wavelength. Sometimes it seemed to Laura that they understood each other without words. They would look at each other and suddenly both would smile as if they had exchanged a funny joke. Veronica enrolled Alejandro in figure skating. The ice helped the boy become more healthy and the endless illnesses stopped. Laura and Isaac were happy about this fact. Soon the young couple fulfilled their longtime dream. They bought their own apartment. The apartment was in the same neighborhood. Both of them didn't want to move far away from the person who did so much for their family, especially for Alejandro. Veronica picked up her grandson from kindergarten and took him to various activities. She was attentive to Alejandro's hobbies. The boy had time to go to hockey, karate, drawing, and chess. And all of this before he went to school. Grandmother showed her grandson how big and diverse the world is and offered him a choice. Eventually, Alejandro decided to choose chess and swimming, and the boy was successful in both. Alejandro was intelligent, strong, and athletic. He was like that thanks to his grandmother. Laura's parents also loved Alejandro, and he loved them, but these relations were not as warm, deep, and sincere as the relations formed between the boy and Veronica. 
Laura's mother and father were still young, and naturally, they focused their attention on Rodrigo and Eva. The teenagers, unlike the obedient Laura, were giving their mother and father a hard time. Veronica, on the other hand, was completely focused on Alejandro, and Laura was happy about that. Alejandro was growing up and pleasing the relatives. He was charming, smart, an excellent student, winner of numerous Olympiads in physics and mathematics. Either constant Veronica's lessons gave such a result, or the genes of his grandmother engineer were manifested, or all together. It doesn't matter. The main thing is that Alejandro was an excellent boy. He studied a lot, but he also had time to play sports and have fun with his friends. He always had many friends. Veronica gladly welcomed children's companies at home, always made tea for boys and girls, and talked with them. Alejandro's friends liked his grandmother. Laura listened to the stories of her friends and colleagues about their mothers-in-law and was shocked. Could it be possible? and she was glad that she was very lucky to have such a great mother-in-law. Laura could discuss any problem with Veronica. She always listened attentively to her daughter-in-law and always knew what to say to support her. That was priceless. And Veronica did so much for Alejandro. Laura couldn't express her gratitude in words. Isaac and Laura wanted to have another baby one day. Alejandro was about 10 years old at the time, and he asked for a brother or sister, but a brother would be better. His parents were still young, they both had good jobs, an apartment, a car, and a good income. Why not? But it didn't work out. Laura was diagnosed with some kind of women's health problem. She tried to get treatment and even traveled to the capital for a checkup, but nothing worked. She had to accept the fact that Alejandro would be their only child. Laura stroked her son's lifeless hand. It was warm, but Alejandro didn't feel anything at all. Would it be easier for her now if she and Isaac had another son or daughter? She didn't know. She doesn't have any other children anyway, and she never will. Alejandro will be gone soon, too. He's almost gone. When an accident happened, Laura had hoped desperately that everything would be all right. But it's been a week now that she's been painfully accepting the terrible truth. Alejandro was gone. But it was hard to believe it when he was lying there in front of her, breathing. Even if not by himself, but with the help of a machine, but still, his body was breathing. When Laura saw her son like that for the first time after the accident, after the surgery, she breathed a sigh of relief. Alejandro was just sleeping, there were no wounds on him, and his face was calm, peaceful. He would wake up, he would open his eyes, look at his parents, and smile his wide smile, showing the dimples on his cheeks that the midwife had noticed in the first minutes of his life. But the doctor's words took away their hope. That accident was not Alejandro's fault. Late at night, he went to pick up his friends from a nightclub. The guys had some trouble there, whether they had been robbed or something else. Anyway, they had no money for a cab. Alejandro was preparing for another exam, and he was glad to have an opportunity to distract himself a little from textbooks to get some rest. Laura let her son go with a calm heart. She was watching her favorite show on her tablet, but Isaac was already asleep. He had to be at work early in the morning. The roads were almost empty at night. Laura knew for sure that nothing was going to happen. There was nothing to worry about. Alejandro still didn't fully realize that he was a happy car owner. The young man had been going to his dream for a long time. The guy studied at the university and worked part-time, got a job as a bartender at the local bar. He worked in the evening. After his studies, he needed money for his own car. By the way, it seems that in this bar Alejandro met that girl, or maybe not there, maybe at the university. There's no way to find out now. He hadn't told his parents about her, but Veronica might have known something. Alejandro always told her his deepest secrets. Laura wasn't jealous, no. On the contrary, she liked that her son had someone so close to him. Alejandro obviously had a romance for some time, something serious. Laura could see it in some minor things, the phone calls at night, a special voice, an enigmatic smile that sometimes wandered across Alejandro's face. 
Laura didn't pressure her son. When the time came, he would tell her everything. There was no point in bothering the grown-up guy with unnecessary questions. Laura hoped that this girl was nice, kind, and loved Alejandro. She dreamed that her son would introduce them soon, and she was going to be as tactful and wise as Veronica had been years ago. But it never happened. Alejandro had dreamed of cars since childhood. When he was still a child, he often asked his grandmother or parents to take him to an amusement park. His favorite activity there was the racetrack. Attentive Veronica was the first to notice that her grandson was very skillful with his car, and then his parents saw it too. Alejandro's favorite toys have always been cars. When he grew up, the passion didn't go away. When he was 13, as soon as Alejandro's legs started to reach the pedals, he asked his father to teach him how to drive. And, of course, when he was 18, he got his driver's license. He passed the exam at the driving school easily. There was nothing too complicated for a man who had been driving since he was a teenager. Alejandro was happy to drive his father's car, but always dreamed of his own car. For the sake of it, he even got a job as a bartender. It was hard to combine study and work, but the boy was purposeful and independent since childhood. By the way, it was Veronica who instilled these qualities in him. Despite the fact that his grandmother was always around, Alejandro did not grow up a spoiled, lazy grandchild. He was able to do everything himself, cook something, wash the dishes, clean the apartment, and even fix the faucet. Veronica never did anything for her grandson. She taught him independence and gave him freedom. When Alejandro finally bought his own car, he was overjoyed. He felt like a winner. His parents and grandmother were genuinely happy for the guy, and of course, proud of such a purposeful son and grandson. The car was old, but still fairly good, and Alejandro liked it a lot. He improved it a little, he put a powerful stereo, tinted the rear windows, painted something, changed something. Alejandro still couldn't believe that this nice car was his property. He enjoyed every opportunity to ride his iron horse. So it happened that evening. His friends asked him to pick them up. Alejandro could not and did not want to refuse. I'll be back in about an hour, he told Laura, heading for the front door. She smiled at her son and told him to be careful. No, she didn't have any premonitions. It was just that Laura always said that phrase to Alejandro whenever he left the house. The woman didn't realize at the time that it was their last conversation. The next time she would see her son asleep and wrapped in wires. A phone rang about an hour after Alejandro had left. Laura thought that it was her son, who had probably decided to go somewhere with his friends, so he was calling to inform his mother so that she wouldn't worry. Indeed, Alejandro's number appeared on the phone screen, but the voice in the receiver was strange and unfamiliar, and it was a female voice. Probably it was a doctor, who arrived at the scene of the accident. She said that there had been a crash at the intersection and that Alejandro was unconscious and was being taken to the hospital. Laura didn't remember the next events very well. She screamed, which woke Isaac up. They went to the hospital together. While they got there, while they found information about their son, Alejandro was lying on the operating table. His friends were waiting in the hallway for the outcome of the surgery. They were in the car, too, but they were completely unharmed. It happens. The guys looked guilty, pale, shocked. One of them couldn't hold back his tears at all. They're the ones who told Laura and Isaac what happened. Alejandro's car had been hit at full speed by an SUV at an intersection while the light was red. The driver was a drunk guy who was coming home from a nightclub. He could barely speak and didn't even seem to realize what he had done. The back of the car was completely crushed. One of the guys was saved by the fact that by some miracle he fell out of the car during the hit. He had abrasions on his palms and his jeans on his knees were torn, but he was okay. The other passenger wasn't hurt either. And here's Alejandro. No visible injuries on him, but he was unconscious. From what the doctors said, the boys realized that something serious had happened to their friend, and now they were sitting together with his parents near the door of the operating room, hoping for a good outcome. Laura was praying. 
It was the first time she'd ever done it, but the right words somehow popped into her head. She asked the Almighty to keep her child alive, and basically, this wish was fulfilled because Alejandro survived, but he is alive, his condition is severe but stable, the tired doctor explained, coming out of the operating room. But we need to talk in my office. And there, behind a closed door, the doctor told the confused parents the truth. Alejandro has a fracture of the skull base, the trauma is severe. If the boy survives, which is very unlikely, he will be disabled. Laura burst into tears right there in the office. Isaac held her tightly in his arms, but he was close to a breakdown himself, the woman felt it. There's always a chance for a miracle in life, the stern doctor said suddenly. I have a lot of experience, I've seen a lot of things in my life. The boy is not doing well, but we'll do everything we can. Just don't lose hope. The inconsolable parents went home. Just a few hours ago, their life was happy and serene. One second, and the world turned upside down, became suddenly gray, depressing, and hopeless. Before that, Laura had dreamed that her son would graduate, become a successful rich engineer, and get married, but now she only hoped that he would come to his senses and at least remember his parents. Veronica called early in the morning. Laura stared at the phone screen and hesitated to pick up. How could she tell her mother-in-law what had happened tonight? The truth could be very harmful to the health of an elderly person. Alejandro was her whole world, her light in the window, her joy and happiness. How could she tell Veronica that even if he survives, he will never be the same again? Isaac answered. Laura couldn't hear what he was saying to his mother. It was too much for her to hear. The woman went to his room and lay in her son's bed, hugging the pillow that kept his smell, and prayed again. Mom felt that something was wrong. Isaac entered Alejandro's room and sat on the edge of the bed next to his wife. She had a dream about Alejandro this morning, saying he was in trouble. I can't believe it. Yes, it was strange, but Laura had no energy left to feel any emotion about it. The days of waiting dragged on. Alejandro underwent several more brain surgeries, and his condition didn't get worse, but it didn't get better either. Laura and Isaac flinched at every phone call, both of them thinking it was from the hospital. No matter what the news was, Alejandro seemed to be alive, but not fully. At any minute he could either wake up or... That's why his parents were so worried when the phone rang. Every day they went to see their son. The doctor advised them to talk to him, to hold his hand. The doctor ordered that the parents be allowed to see Alejandro in the intensive care unit. Sometimes it helps, he told Laura and Isaac, the presence of loved ones helps them come back. Also, people who come out of comas often say they remember what was going on around them. Unlike many of my colleagues, I think it's important to be around the patient during such a critical period. Laura and Isaac were there. Veronica wanted to come too, but Laura and Isaac talked her out of it. Both of them didn't want Veronica to see her grandson in that condition. Her heart wouldn't be able to take it. They were young, but even they could barely cope. But Veronica was surprisingly strong. She was there for Isaac and Laura in a tough moment, reminding them to eat, cleaning their apartment, talking to them, and distracting them. Together with Laura, Veronica surfed the internet. The grandmother and mother searched for information about injuries similar to Alejandro's. There was not much information that could encourage them, but still, they found something good. There were rare cases where people in similar situations recovered fully. There was still hope, and the women grasped at it with all their might. And then, about two months later, when everyone was already used to this reality, there was another shock. Cerebral edema. They managed to save him at night, but the consequences? The consequences were catastrophic brain activity was completely gone. The heart was working perfectly well, and all the other vital organs were working, but it was all useless because the main controlling organ, the brain, was almost dead. Laura cried out when she heard the news. The doctor had called her early in the morning to inform her about the change in Alejandro's condition. At first, Isaac thought Alejandro was gone. He got scared and turned pale. 
Then, realizing that his son was alive, he decided to go to him immediately. Alejandro. His appearance hasn't changed. The same closed eyes, the same serene expression. He's just sleeping. He will surely wake up soon. But now the doctor didn't believe there was the slightest chance of a happy outcome, didn't talk about a miracle anymore, and didn't recommend talking to the patient. His brain is dead. It's irreversible. You have to sign the papers to disconnect your son from life support machines. No, Laura said firmly as she looked at the doctor, I will never let you do that. Isaac supported her then. It was hard to believe it was over when Alejandro was lying in a hospital bed breathing, warm and alive. The doctor sighed sadly, shook his head, and covered his face with his hands. It was obvious that it wasn't easy for him either. We'll talk later, the man in the hospital uniform finally said, you need to get used to the idea and accept the information. You will understand everything. I recommend seeing a psychotherapist. It's hard. You need to think about yourself, too. Laura was like a lump of pain. She couldn't eat or drink anything, couldn't talk to anyone. The woman vaguely remembered this time. Rarely she saw the worried faces of her parents, Isaac, and Veronica through the dark veil of grief. One medical counsel after another. Isaac, her parents, and Veronica, they made some phone calls and arranged meetings with doctors from other cities and medical councils. Alejandro was examined again and again. The doctor's verdict was unambiguous. There was no hope. It was pointless to keep the young man alive. Isaac made a fatal decision and gently, very carefully began to explain it to his wife. He realized that there was no other way out, that they had already lost their dear boy, but Laura didn't want to hear anything about it. She resisted, yelled at her husband, insulted him, and even blamed him for what had happened to Alejandro. He kept silent and looked at his wife with eyes full of pain, and then started talking again, explaining that it was too selfish to prolong the agony of a man who would never wake up. What about miracles? They do happen, even the doctor said so, Laura persisted. That was before. Before his brain. There was still some hope then. We still have hope, the inconsolable mother argued. She couldn't accept the fact that her son was gone. She saw him every day, warm, breathing, alive. Alejandro looked like he was just asleep. How could it be that modern medicine with all its achievements can't save her son? It's impossible. Laura even contacted professors from abroad and showed them the results of his examinations. But the answer was the same, no hope. One day the woman suddenly accepted the terrible truth. She had no strength left to fight. But that wasn't even the main reason. She realized that Alejandro would never come back. So much money and time had been spent to find even a glimmer of hope, to get the slightest chance, but all the facts said that it was impossible to save Alejandro. There's no point in keeping him in this world, torturing him. Besides Laura, it seemed that only Veronica still couldn't accept the truth. She raised Alejandro, he was the meaning of her life. Of course, the grandmother couldn't believe that her grandson was gone. In spite of everything, Veronica hoped, prayed, searched the internet, and looked for doctors and healers who would not refuse to treat such a difficult patient. A woman who was absolutely not superstitious before and not religious suddenly began to go to the local church regularly. She even went to fortune tellers. One of them gave Veronica hope. Of course, it was just a lie. She told Veronica that she saw great-grandchildren in her future, and since Alejandro was her only grandson, there was no one else to give her great-grandchildren. So the old woman drew a conclusion Alejandro would survive. Veronica grasped this fragile hope, believed the fortune teller, and even became somewhat stronger and more focused. Laura was grateful to her mother-in-law for such faith in Alejandro. But that day she finally realized that everything was over. The realization suddenly struck her. Laura sighed heavily, wiped away her tears, and called Isaac. Unlike his wife, he kept going to work during those two hardest months. As he worked, he was distracted from depressing thoughts. The physical and mental fatigue helped him not to drown in grief. But Laura could not focus on her work duties. 
She was grateful to her boss for not firing her. He just let her go on unpaid leave realizing that she needed time to come to her senses. So, Isaac and Laura were sitting near Alejandro's bed. He had lost a lot of weight over the past couple of months, lying under a white sheet, skinny and pale. He was nothing like he was two months ago. He was always full of vitality, always smiling, energizing others with positivity. Thanks to swimming lessons, Alejandro was always in great shape. Also, he was always stylish. Muscles visible under his t-shirt, confident look, and charming smile. Young girls couldn't take their eyes off him. Laura was so proud of her son. She was sure that he had a long and happy life ahead of him. Of course, he would. What kind of life could a guy like that have? But fate had other plans. Alejandro will be disconnected from life support today. Doctors gave the parents time to say goodbye, to hold their son's warm palm one last time, and maybe to say some words to him. They were lucky because not many families had the opportunity to say goodbye like that. And then it's over. The only good thing is that Alejandro won't feel anything. He hasn't felt anything for a long time. They decided not to inform Veronica. They will say that his heart failed or something else happened. Anything can happen to a patient in a deep coma. It was better for her not to know because she still believed in miracles and she would never be able to forgive them for such a decision. Laura stroked her son's arm. She wished these moments could last forever. She wished time would stop right now, and that terrible moment would never come. But that was just a silly fantasy. She had to be realistic, to stay strong for Isaac, for her parents, for Veronica. It seemed to Laura now that her life would lose its meaning without Alejandro. During these months, she realized that for the past 20 years, she had lived only for her son, and everything she did was only for his sake. All her plans and dreams for the future were connected with Alejandro, only with him. And now what? There's no future anymore? But there was nothing she could do. Laura was adjusting the pillow under Alejandro's head when the door of the room opened with a rumble. The woman shuddered. Was it really time? But they'd been promised to have an hour to say goodbye, and it hadn't even been 20 minutes yet. Isaac flinched at the unexpected sound, and the nerves of both spouses were on edge. Veronica burst into the room, and a worried nurse ran after her. Get out of here. His legal representatives are here. Leave the people alone. It's all right, Isaac said. It's his grandmother. She has the right to say goodbye, too. As you wish, the chubby girl in the hospital uniform shrugged her shoulders. She left the room and closed the door behind her. What are you doing? Veronica attacked them. Why did you let them disconnect him from his life support? Because there was no other way out. Laura answered. She was in such a state that she didn't even ask how Veronica found out what was going on. It's not Alejandro anymore, Isaac shook his head. Alejandro is gone. So why torture the body? Alejandro is still Alejandro, Veronica said. It's just that he's far away now, unable to reach us, but still, he already managed to do some things. Laura stared at her mother-in-law. Has she gone crazy with grief? Her mother-in-law had always been the most adequate and smart person Laura had ever known, and now she was saying some nonsense. Mom, calm down, Isaac tried to calm her down. Listen to me, Veronica demanded, just listen to me. Do we still have time? Alejandro's parents nodded silently. Then Veronica went to her grandson and hugged him for the first time. My dear boy, when you come back, you'll have a hard time. There will be a lot of work to do, but you will recover. Because you're strong. Isaac and Laura looked at each other. Veronica's behavior worried them more and more. Why are you looking at me like I'm crazy? She asked. Do you think I've lost my mind because of the tragedy? I will not hide it. Not long ago, I was close to it. I was even going to see a doctor. I could not cope with my grief. But today, today something happened. And Veronica told an absolutely mind-blowing story. In the evening, she went to bed taking her sleeping pills as usual. 
Lately, Veronica couldn't fall asleep without pills because she had too many heavy thoughts in her head. Alejandro, her only grandson, was her joy, hope, and happiness. Veronica dreamed of celebrating his wedding and even of babysitting her great-grandchildren. She wanted to see her grandson become a successful adult. The woman opened a separate bank account without saying a word to anyone. By the time of the accident, there was already a good sum of money there. The loving grandmother wanted to make a gift to her grandson for the wedding, but the tragedy happened and all the money was spent on doctor's consultations and treatment. Veronica could not accept what had happened to Alejandro, and she thought that Laura would fight for him to the very end. She was sure of it. This morning she had a very strange dream. Maybe it wasn't even a dream, because everything seemed too realistic. It was as if Veronica had been transported to some other dimension. The woman was in a wide meadow. It was hot. Probably it was summer. Clouds floated lazily across the bright blue sky. The grasshoppers chirped in the grass, which pleasantly tingled Veronica's bare feet. Veronica could smell the plants, the scent of wormwood and clover. But we can't smell anything while we're asleep, can we? She could clearly feel the gentle breeze and hear the sounds of nature. Veronica looked around in surprise. In the distance, she could see roofs and smoke rising from some of the chimneys. Apparently, there was some village. There was a dark forest beyond the village, and on the other side, beyond the bushy hills, she could see the red chimneys of the factory. In the middle of the meadow, not far from Veronica, there was a tall water tower, but for some reason, it stood far away from the village. Maybe it had been abandoned for a long time because it looked too old and almost ruined. Veronica knew at once that something was going to happen. And indeed, the old woman didn't notice when exactly it happened, a dark dot appeared on the horizon near the hills and chimneys of the distant factory. It was getting closer and closer, and soon she could see a human silhouette. Veronica recognized him from afar. It was Alejandro, her dear Alejandro, and he was perfectly healthy. The old woman's heart clenched painfully, and tears came to her eyes. Veronica knew that her grandson was in the intensive care unit, wrapped in wires, so it was just a dream, though a very realistic one. Meanwhile, Alejandro approached his grandmother. He looked at her with a slightly sad smile. There was so much love in his eyes, so much tenderness. Veronica wanted to hug her grandson, but he deftly stepped back. If you touch me, I'll disappear. I want to hug you too, but it's not possible, not here. Alejandro, honey, how are you? The words came out of Veronica's mouth along with the sobs. She wanted to pull herself together to talk to Alejandro calmly, but nothing worked. How could this have happened? The old woman wailed. Why? The grandson looked at her with compassion and love, waiting for his grandmother to calm down a little. He obviously needed to tell her something important. Veronica sensed it. Are you in pain? Veronica finally asked one of the many questions that tormented her. Alejandro shook his head negatively. Will you come back? That's what bothered Veronica the most. I don't know, he shrugged. I'm trying, looking for a way out. He was so handsome. The July sun tinted his skin a nice bronze color, and the sun bleached his hair a little. We're waiting for you, and we love you. Come back soon, please. I'm trying. Alejandro, is there something you want to tell me? Yes, I'm so happy I managed to get through to you. I tried to talk to my mom and dad too. I didn't want to worry you at first, but there was a blank wall between us. And it was surprisingly easy to reach you. But we don't have much time. I got it. We don't have much time. I'm sorry. I won't cry anymore and ask unnecessary questions. Go ahead. The problem is that my mother and father lost their faith not so long ago. I sensed it. And then I found out that they want to disconnect me from the machines. And then I'll, you know, I'll go away for good. And I can't. I'm too young. I have some unfinished things to do here. Disconnect you? Veronica, shocked by her grandson's revelation, didn't even pay attention to the second part of his sentence, the one that referred to his unfinished matters. Disconnect. 
That's not true. Laura, your mom, she and I are both against it. Maybe Isaac is hesitant, but Laura and I are fighting for you. Mom's lost faith, too. She's tired, very tired. It's so hard for her. She feels so bad, worse than you, Grandma. You have a lot of hope and faith. Mom is weaker. When do they want to do it? Veronica suddenly completely believed her grandson's words. She remembered how aloof and indifferent Laura had been lately. She realized that her daughter-in-law was completely broken. Tomorrow, or rather today. It's the middle of the night out there. I won't let them, Veronica said firmly. I won't let them, no way. That's why I'm here. Stop them. I'll come back. I'll find a way out. I have urgent things to do here. What things? I haven't told you. I haven't had time. It's just that I was dating a girl. She's very nice. There are no other girls like her in the world. Her name is Paulina. She moved from the countryside to the city to study. I fell in love, Grandma, for real. I'd never been in love like that before. The previous crush was nothing like this. Next to her, I felt strong, almost omnipotent. Veronica smiled as she listened to her grandson. She smiled, despite the horrible circumstances of this meeting, which either really happened or not. She was happy that her grandson had experienced such wonderful feelings. Some people never get that chance in their whole life. We started dating. I felt like the luckiest man in the world. Paulina loved me too. I know she did. She was so shy, so tender, so vulnerable. I wanted to protect her and keep her safe. And then, then she suddenly decided to end our relationship. Why? Veronica gasped. You said she loved you, too. She still loves me, Alejandro smiled. I know that for sure now. I've seen and learned a lot now, a lot of things that I could never have imagined before. Because of this new condition? Is that why you know everything now? Veronica asked. The grandson nodded. One day Paulina just disappeared. She disappeared without even telling me. I went to the dean's office afterward. She dropped out of university, though she had always studied very well. Paulina dreamed of becoming a successful lawyer and she was moving steadily towards her goal. It was strange. And then, then her friend handed me a note. In the note, Paulina said she was sick of everything, her studies, the city, and me. She asked me not to look for her, to forget and forgive her. A girl who looked at me with such tenderness and love couldn't write something like that. But it was Paulina's handwriting, I know that. How did you get over it? I haven't gotten over it yet. To distract myself, I studied and had fun with my friends more often. Outwardly, I thought I was doing very well. Really well, Veronica confirmed. We didn't even notice anything, not even me. Although you know how good I sense everything that is going on in your life. I know, Alejandro agreed, that's probably why I found a path to you. Anyway, I was very worried, missing her voice, her eyes, her touch. And then this tragedy happened to me, the accident. I didn't understand anything at first, I was floating somewhere in a gray fog, and sometimes voices came to me, I recognized you, my parents. And then, then everything became clear, and I understood everything, I saw everything. Veronica felt tears running down her cheeks. She was clearly feeling those salty hot tears. It felt so real, it couldn't be a dream. Time is running out, Alejandro suddenly got worried. Listen and remember. Paulina lives in this very village that you can see behind us. She is in a desperate situation. She has had a great misfortune in her life. She needs help, badly. And I'm lying there covered in tubes. I can't even move my arm. Alejandro wrinkled his nose at these words. She can't cope on her own. If I can't help her yet, please do it instead of me. Don't disconnect me. Don't let me go. I'll be back. For you, for Paulina, and for our baby. You have a baby? Veronica was surprised. She must have looked quite funny at that moment because Alejandro suddenly smiled cheerfully. 
Well, as a matter of fact, yes, we have a baby. Paulina is pregnant. I didn't know about it before the accident, and then a lot of things became clear to me. Veronica suddenly noticed with horror that Alejandro was fading. The grandson was rapidly losing color, becoming transparent. The woman realized that very soon he would disappear into thin air. Where should we look for her? What is the name of her village? I don't know, Alejandro looked at his grandmother with hope. I don't know where she lives. But I showed you this place, look around. This place looks like this. I get it. I'll do my best, Veronica promised Alejandro. She really hoped her grandson heard her words before he disappeared. Laura Isaac Veronica Veronica finished her strange story, and Laura and Isaac stared at her dumbfounded. Mom, Isaac began, but you know it was just a dream, right? You're stressed out, and your brain is looking for ways to make the truth not so scary. It wasn't just a dream, Veronica said. I really saw Alejandro somewhere, in some dimension, probably between two worlds. Laura silently searched for something on her phone, frantically pressing buttons and scrolling through some photos. What are you doing? Veronica looked at the screen of Laura's smartphone. I'm looking at the pictures of different factories in our region, she answered. Can you see the same chimneys that you saw near that village? Both women were now staring intently at the screen. Isaac looked at them almost with fear. Had both of them gone mad from the overwhelming grief they were experiencing? I found it, Veronica said confidently, pointing her finger at one of the pictures. It's the same factory, the same chimneys, I'm sure. It's a brick factory a hundred kilometers away. Laura was already reading the information about the factory. Isaac realized that he would go to the chief doctor's office now and ask to postpone the disconnection. It was not normal, but looking at his mother and wife, the man suddenly felt hopeful, felt that they should give their son a chance. Isaac's car was driving down the highway. The sun shone brightly from the sky, there were blossoming fields on both sides of the deserted road, and occasionally dark lines of plantations and groves glimmered on the horizon. The chief doctor was very surprised, but he didn't try to dissuade the relatives. Now Alejandro had time. No one would disconnect him from the machines until they... Until what? The idea was certainly very strange. An old woman, the inconsolable grandmother of a guy in a deep coma, saw a dream, just a dream, albeit a realistic one. And now the whole family is traveling to find the place from that dream. It was silly, and both Laura and Isaac had a lot of doubts about it, but there was hope, too. If there was even a small chance that any of this was true, they should grab that chance. It was better to regret what had been done than what hadn't been done, especially in a situation like this. There they are, those chimneys, Veronica was the first to spot the factory on the horizon, and the hills around them are the same. I just don't know where that meadow is, on which side. We should drive around the place. Isaac shrugged. He was imitating a reasonable skepticism for some reason, trying to show that he didn't really believe in the idea, just fulfilling a strange wish of his mother and wife. If the women wanted to drive around the factory, he would do it. But the truth was that the man's heart was pounding desperately. Isaac hoped that they would really find the old tower from his mother's dream. By finding this tower, they will be able to find the village where Paulina lives. If Paulina even exists. But he wanted to believe in a miracle. The car had already made numerous rounds around the neighborhood of the factory. No one had seen anything that looked like a water tower. Laura was almost crying. Even Veronica looked puzzled. And then Isaac realized. The terrain was hilly. They could miss not only the old tower, but the whole lake. He stopped the car and got out into the field. The man headed straight for a high hill covered with grass. He had to climb to the top. From there he could see everything. The women stayed near the car. Veronica would hardly climb such a hill. She was certainly strong for her age but she would hardly be strong enough for such a challenge. Besides, both women were afraid. What if Isaac would see nothing from the hill? In that case, the whole story was just a figment of Veronica's imagination. 
Laura looked anxiously at her husband. He was climbing the hill like a stubborn ant, higher and higher. Finally, he was at the very top, waving his hands at them, it seemed that he was even smiling. From such a distance it is difficult to see, besides the sun was blinding them. But there's no doubt, Isaac saw something. He sees the tower, Veronica smiled, Alejandro showed me the right place. Yes, Isaac really saw a tower from the hill, old and shabby tower, almost ruined. Exactly as Veronica had described it. A few minutes later, all three of them were standing at the foot of the water tower. It's here, Veronica looked around in surprise. Wow, it's just like in my dream. That's the village Alejandro had pointed out to me. In the distance, they could see the roofs of houses. The village was small and somewhat deserted. Laura, Isaac, and Veronica wandered through the quiet, dusty streets, hoping to meet someone. Surely everyone here knew each other, and passers-by would tell them where to find the mysterious Paulina, if she existed. However, there was no doubt after Veronica found the place that Alejandro showed. Something strange and inexplicable was happening to Alejandro's parents and grandmother. Finally, luck smiled on them. Two boys of about 12 were both suntanned, barefoot, and skinny, and they looked at the strangers with a mixture of curiosity and suspicion. Hello, gentlemen, Veronica smiled at them. The boys responded to the greeting in unison. We are looking for a girl here, Laura joined the conversation. We're not locals, we don't know where she lives. Who are you looking for? One of the teenagers asked in a business-like manner. Paulina, I don't remember her last name. Paulina Santis, the other boy immediately assumed, there is no other Paulina here. Where does she live? Laura tried her best to keep her voice steady and calm. Everything inside her clenched with the anticipation of a miracle. The hope that Alejandro would be all right was returning to her. Something absolutely incredible, impossible was happening. Over there, in the house with the green roof at the end of the street. The boys moved on, and the travelers headed to the house with the green roof. Soon they found themselves near the gate of the house the boys had pointed out to them. So, why are we standing like frozen? Veronica smiled at Laura and Isaac. We should knock on the door. The old woman knocked on the iron gate carefully, but loudly. The fence was very high, and it was impossible to see what was going on in the garden. A minute later, footsteps sounded, the gate squeaked open, and they saw a young skinny girl with big bright eyes. She was dressed in a modest sundress, and her wavy wheat-colored hair was loose over her shoulders. Oh, she said in surprise, I thought it was loose. Are you Paulina? Laura asked. Yes, the girl nodded. I think I know you. You have a son, Alejandro, right? Yes, Isaac answered. Alejandro showed me family pictures. But I don't understand how you found me. And why? Sweetheart, we need to talk. Veronica smiled affectionately. It's a long and strange story. Come in, Paulina said, letting the guests inside. The yard turned out to be spacious, beautiful, and well-maintained. Tidy beds, apple trees, and many flowers. There were swings, a slide, and an iron ladder next to a nice white house with a green roof. There was a clothesline between the trees with children's clothes on it. Toys were everywhere, dolls, balls, and cars. It was obvious that children lived in this house. Please, take a seat here, Paulina pointed with her hand to a cozy gazebo. It's beautiful, Isaac praised. Dad made it himself. The guests and excited Paulina walked into the gazebo. They were glad to be seated on the comfortable, wide bench. Paulina went into the house. A couple of minutes later the girl returned to the guests with a tray containing four glasses of lemonade. Here, you must be thirsty. Alejandro's parents and grandmother liked the polite, caring girl more and more. Paulina looked questioningly at the guests. Veronica sighed and began her long and very unusual story. When the old woman told about the accident that caused Alejandro's coma, Paulina gasped, turned pale, and covered her face with her hands. I didn't know. She exclaimed. 
Is Alejandro alive? Yes, but in a severe condition, he is in a coma. The doctors can't wake him up, Laura explained. What a horror. Paulina had tears in her eyes. I want to see him. He'll be fine, sweetheart. Veronica stroked Paulina's hand affectionately. Now I know it for sure. And you, you shouldn't be so nervous. It's not good for the baby. Paulina stared at her in surprise. How? How do you know? I didn't even tell Alejandro anything. First I didn't have time, and then I didn't want to put such a burden on his shoulders. Nobody knows about it yet. How? Veronica smiled sadly and continued her detailed story in a calm, comforting voice. She talked about Alejandro's worsening condition, about the numerous examinations and consultations, about the doctor's suggestion to disconnect Alejandro, and that his parents agreed to do that. And then, then it was time to tell about an amazing dream. Or not a dream. He showed me this place, told me about you, and asked me not to disconnect him from life support because you need help. Alejandro said you were in a desperate situation. Is that true? It's true, Paulina nodded. She looked at Veronica with wide open eyes. The girl's eyes showed that she believed the story but didn't understand how it was possible. The story was really strange, but it was impossible not to believe it. Tell me, what happened to you? Laura took Paulina's fragile palm in her hand. We're not strangers now, and we'll help you, whatever it is. My story is not a happy one, she sighed. I don't like to complain about life, but I'll tell you everything. Paulina grew up in a happy, but poor family with many children. Her parents worked in the nearest district center. Her mother worked as a history teacher and her father was a foreman at the local brick factory, the one with the red chimneys rising over the hills. Paulina was the eldest daughter. For a long time, she was the only child in the family, and when she turned 10, her parents gave her the gift she wanted, a sister. A year later, Santis gave birth to twins, a boy and a girl. Paulina was happy to babysit the little ones. She liked to watch them grow up, become independent, and show their personality. Paulina was always a good student. She had a dream to become a lawyer and protect people who have no money for a good lawyer. The girl chose her profession when she was in the sixth grade and gradually moved towards her goal. No one was surprised when a talented girl was accepted to a good university after high school. Paulina was over the moon when she saw her name on the list of accepted students. A whole new life was beginning for her. The girl from the village was provided with a dormitory. Paulina quickly found a common language with her roommates. The girl missed her parents, sisters, and brother, but soon the vivid, intense student life completely absorbed her. And then, in the third year, Paulina met Alejandro. They met at the lecture. A famous writer from England had come to the university. Ten or fifteen people from each faculty were selected for this meeting, only the best students. Paulina and Alejandro were among the chosen ones. They were sitting next to each other, and their shoulders sometimes accidentally happened to touch each other. Paulina immediately liked the handsome, smiling guy. She secretly admired his face. And whenever he accidentally touched her arm, her heart began to race. Paulina didn't think she could expect attention from this handsome guy. He was too charismatic, too stylish. Probably he already had a girlfriend, maybe even more than one. No, such a guy is not for her. And what was the girl's surprise when almost at the end of the lecture Alejandro suggested running away? It's boring here, isn't it? He whispered, looking at Paulina. She didn't even understand the meaning of his words right away. The fact that this handsome guy was looking at her, talking to her, seemed unbelievable. Alejandro repeated the question, and Paulina finally smiled and nodded affirmatively. I suggest we run away from here quietly, the boy smiled slyly. Will you join me? He shouldn't even have asked, of course, Paulina would join him. She would follow him even to the end of the world because she had never experienced such strong feelings from just being close to another person. That day, running away from the lecture, which promised to be interesting, but turned out to be boring, they met. At first, they just learned each other's names, nothing more. 
the young people wandered around the city, admiring the fountains and monuments. Very soon the real cold fall would come, with continuous rain and clouds, but for now, it was September, and the summer was still in full swing. Alejandro bought an ice cream for Paulina, and they walked along the wide main street, laughing and feeding the cheeky sparrows with pieces of waffle. Paulina was surprised at herself. She had always been a modest, shy girl, especially when she interacted with guys, but now. For some reason, Paulina felt relaxed, natural, and calm next to Alejandro, as if they had known each other for a hundred years. Alejandro also behaved like they knew each other for years. The evening came, and the young people still didn't want to part. I feel so good with you, Alejandro suddenly confessed. They were sitting on a bench in the park right in front of the tall monument. Paulina's heart pounded with joy. She felt that this guy liked her, otherwise, why would he still be with her, but it was still nice to hear this confession. Then they kissed for a long time, right in front of the others. For the first time in her life, Paulina didn't care what people around her thought about her, as long as he was by her side. They started dating. Paulina thought it was a strange time. The more the girl got to know Alejandro, the better she understood that she was not suitable for him. A modest country girl from a large family. And he. He is a golden boy, the son of successful wealthy parents, and the best student. He was popular, smart, handsome, and funny. He has so many opportunities, and so many plans for his future. Of course, he needs another girl, the daughter of rich parents, a real beauty. Paulina thought that she was not suitable for Alejandro, and everyone around her confirmed it. Great job, you've got a great guy. The girls from the dormitory sincerely praised her. If you get pregnant, it's a success, your future will be fantastic. He already has a car, his parents will probably buy him a good apartment, and you'll live like a queen. So, don't be stupid, and don't hesitate. Do everything possible to guarantee a good future for yourself. So that's how their relationship looked from the outside. When Paulina was with Alejandro, she felt happy and calm, but when he left, there were heavy thoughts that they were not even a couple. Alejandro was gentle, caring, and sensitive, and gave his girlfriend a lot of gifts. He liked to see her eyes sparkle with joy. Sometimes she didn't even have to tell him what she wanted, he understood her without words and fulfilled her wishes right away. And then, the news about her pregnancy came out of the blue. The girl cried for a long time. She wanted this baby. It's her and Alejandro's baby, their continuation. But, on the other hand, Paulina understood perfectly well what it all looked like. So the girls from the dormitory were right. Paulina is an ordinary country girl who got a rich city boy and now she tries to tie him to herself using a baby. Alejandro was just a ticket to a better life for her, a way out of the village. I know, it's silly, Paulina looked at the silent listeners, but that's why I didn't tell Alejandro about the pregnancy, I was going to, but I didn't dare, I was afraid he'd think the same thing as my roommates in the dormitory. I mean, that's what it looked like, right? You'd think that too, think I was a selfish, greedy girl from the village who got pregnant to force a rich guy to marry her. Laura shook her head negatively. Isaac sighed heavily and rubbed his temples. Veronica answered for everyone. No, honey, you shouldn't draw such conclusions. Things are different in our family. Alejandro is smart and understanding, and he's also very independent. We've always trusted his choices. Your worries are understandable, but they're empty in this case. Just trust me. I'm so stupid, Paulina said. Maybe if I hadn't run away, if I had told Alejandro everything, trusted him, nothing bad would have happened to him. Why did you leave the city? Laura asked. Why did you come back to the village? A tragedy had happened in my life. Paulina was distressed by the sudden news of her pregnancy. She didn't understand herself. She could suddenly feel boundless happiness, and the next second she could feel anxiety and fear. Paulina wanted to share her secret with Alejandro, especially since he had the right to know. But she was stopped by fear and shame. 
Alejandro gave her no reason to doubt his feelings, and yet Paulina, like a hunted animal, was hiding it from him. Alejandro sensed changes in Paulina's mood. He asked questions and tried to find out the reason, but the girl kept silent, and this led to some problems between the lovers. Alejandro suffered, and Paulina understood it. She could have changed things back then, but she didn't. One night Paulina's phone rang, and the girl immediately tensed up. It was late, the number was unfamiliar, it was alarming. The premonition was correct, it was the police calling her. It turned out that the girl's parents got into a terrible accident on the highway and didn't survive. The terrible news shocked Paulina. She was hysterical, screaming, and couldn't believe it. The girl vaguely remembered that night her roommates, the dormitory janitor, and even the security guard tried to calm her down. Then Paulina pulled herself together because she had so many things to do and she couldn't expect any help. Funeral and taking care of three children, all of this fell on her fragile shoulders. Not so long ago Paulina felt herself the happiest girl on earth and then there was such a drastic change. I dropped out of university and went home. Studying was no longer possible. I had to raise children. I took custody of them, otherwise, they would have been taken to an orphanage. I couldn't let that happen to their my family. I wrote a note for Alejandro. There wasn't a single word of truth in it. I wrote that I didn't love him anymore and I was sick of studying, asked him to forgive me, and wished him happiness in his personal life. I'm so ashamed of it now. I can't even imagine what he thought of me and how painful it was for him at that moment. Why didn't you ask Alejandro for help? Veronica hugged Paulina, who had tears in her eyes at the memory of the recent tragedy. He loves you. He would gladly help you. For the same reason, my stupidity. Plus, I was confused. I didn't want him to be immersed in all of this, and I didn't want Alejandro to feel like I was using him. After all, he had plans for a successful future, and I didn't want to take that away from him. Anyway, I decided that a girl with such problems wasn't the right girl for him. So I came back home. Paulina took custody of the little ones, and now all these months she was getting used to the role of the head of a large family. While she was busy with the funeral, adoption, and other matters, she missed the term when it was still possible to terminate the pregnancy. Well, to be honest, it didn't happen by accident. Paulina could not get rid of the baby, even though it would have been the right decision. I decided that if the universe decided so, then my baby should be born, the girl smiled, putting her hand on her growing belly. No one knew about the pregnancy until now, well, that's what I thought until today. I can't believe it, how is it possible? How did Alejandro find out? How did Alejandro tell you the news? We don't understand, Laura smiled, but we are very happy that we will have a grandson or granddaughter. Alejandro is right, you really need help, Veronica shook her head. How do you cope with everything here? Isaac, who had been silent until now, finally joined the conversation. Paulina wasn't doing great. There wasn't enough money. She didn't have the strength to take care of a huge household. The twins were supposed to go to school this year, and Paulina didn't know where to get the money to buy them everything necessary. And the baby was on the way, but Paulina didn't know anything about taking care of newborns. And again, where would she get the money for food, diapers, and medicine? Not to mention everything else. Social welfare payments will not be enough. Paulina will not be able to work anytime soon for obvious reasons. The situation was desperate. I try to avoid thinking about the future, the girl confessed, sighing heavily, because when I think about it, so many problems immediately appear, and there is no one to help, we are alone, completely alone, no grandparents, no other relatives. That's how it happened. Now you're not alone, Isaac said confidently. Veronica hugged Paulina even tighter, and Laura smiled warmly. Where are the little ones? Isaac asked. I haven't seen or heard anyone. They are asleep, Paulina answered through the tears, but now they were tears of joy and relief, afternoon nap. Then the events unfolded with lightning speed. Paulina and her younger sisters and brother moved into Veronica's apartment. 
they decided to accommodate the whole family there for several reasons. First, Alejandro's grandmother's apartment is more spacious than his parents' apartment. Secondly, Veronica was already retired, so she had time to take care of the kids. The elderly woman gladly immersed herself in taking care of two girls and a boy. She was glad that now she had people living in her home who enjoyed listening to her stories and asked lots of questions about this world. Veronica felt 15 years younger with these children. Laura and Isaac often visited the children or invited them into their apartment. They wanted to have a second child long ago, but it never happened. But now they had three children who needed love, attention, and care. Paulina returned to university. Veronica insisted on it. She assured her that everything would work out because now Paulina was not alone. They would help her to get her diploma, to raise her children, her sisters and brother, and the baby that would soon be born. Paulina often visited Alejandro. Disconnecting him from life support equipment was out of the question now. To the doctor's great surprise, the diagnostic machines detected some minimal brain activity, and this activity was increasing every day. His body started a self-repair program. It's like a miracle. I just can't believe it, the attending physician said. It looks like the boy is coming back. The human brain is an unexplored area, and sometimes we don't understand how it works and what is going on. Such amazing cases are very rare, one in a million. Apparently, your boy really wants to live. Alejandro woke up on New Year's Eve. Veronica and Paulina were in his room at the time. Laura and Isaac had taken the kids to some New Year's Eve event. They were going to visit their son later. Alejandro smiled as he looked at his grandmother and his beloved girl. And then, noticing Paulina's big belly, he said hoarsely, Are we going to have a baby? Exactly like that, with a questioning intonation. The voice sounded quiet, barely audible, but Veronica and Paulina immediately turned to him. They both rushed to Alejandro, burst into tears, and began to embrace him, but he flapped his eyes in surprise and understood nothing. He was weak, very weak. He didn't remember what had happened to him. Alejandro could hardly move his arms and legs. His body didn't obey. It felt as if it wasn't his own body. But it didn't frighten him. He realized with some inner instinct that everything could be fixed. He just needed a little time. He had so many questions. He asked his grandmother and Paulina, struggling to move his disobedient tongue. For some reason they didn't answer, they both sobbed and covered him with kisses. The boy finally stopped talking and waited patiently for the emotions of the distressed ladies to subside. Later, the doctors asked Veronica and Paulina to leave the room. They examined Alejandro for a long time, connected some wires to his head, took tests, and he was recovering rapidly. Of course, the guy had a long recovery ahead of him, but by the time their son was born, Alejandro was already able to pick up his loved ones from the maternity hospital. He was able to hold the precious bundle with the baby in his arms himself. The family moved in with Veronica. Alejandro turned out to be a wonderful father. Where did that come from? He coped with his son perfectly well, and he quickly found a common language with Paulina's sisters and brother. He was still recovering. He had to visit the hospital every day. But Alejandro was not discouraged. He planned to continue his studies next year, but only in a correspondence department and at the same time to work because now he had to support his large family. And this pleased the guy, inspired him and filled him with strength. Moreover, Alejandro felt the strong support of loved ones, grandmother, parents, and, of course, Paulina. The young husband and father had no doubts that everything would work out. The boy realized that he was a couple of steps away from death. Now he knew what had happened to him. The moment of the accident was erased from Alejandro's memory, but there were fragments of memories of those days when he was in a coma, phrases from the conversations of doctors and relatives, the beeping of hospital equipment, even the smell of chlorine the nurses used to wash the floors in the intensive care ward. But Alejandro didn't remember that amazing meeting with his grandmother in a dream. He still didn't understand how it could have happened. The others also couldn't find an explanation. Everyone had his own version. The guy made one guess after another and realized that he would never know the truth. 
Life is mysterious and unpredictable, and there is always a place for a miracle in it. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.